Let's tell us what you know about converting functioning and quantum manipulation. Thank you, Fran. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about collaborations with Nick. Where we need to click on this now. Yeah, yeah. there we go. So um, I think out of all people here, I've known Nick the longest. You know, <laughs> me to say. Um, we, we spent many happy hours sitting together in the back seats of Volvos over the years. Um, and we've had some collaborations. Um, so here's one that I came across when I was tidying up a room a couple of days ago. Um, so we, this is this 1978, so I was about 14, it was maybe 16. Um, this is before the days of back, backing music and karaoke, um, when the clubs in Manchester had a resident organist and drummer. And you've heard already how Nick played the organ. Um, so this is one event where we played together. I played the drums, Nick played the organ. Um, at a bowling presentation night. So this would have been ballroom dancing and maybe a couple of singers. Um, so that was the kind of night that was on offer. Um, and I wanted to point out that recently Paul McCartney was highly praised for doing a three hour set at Glastonbury. Well, the, the fabulous Nick and Des could last for four hours. So we were much better. Um, and then by coincidence, what am I? PhD students asked about condition numbers recently, so I dug out an old paper, um, and I realized this is actually, this is dedicated to Gene Gollab on his 60th birthday, and at the time, that seemed like a long way away, and now it's, it's rapidly approaching even for me, um, and then I remembered th this was finished when I was at Toronto as a postdoc, and Nick was spending a year at Cornell, uh, replacing Charlie, um, and we were desperate to get this work finished. I was living right downtown in Toronto in a very hot uh, summer heat wave, and then power went down in central Toronto. So all the air conditioning went off. Everybody went out into the streets to cool down. The traffic lights were not operating. It was complete chaos. And we were just staunchly heading out of Toronto, trying to find a coffee shop where we could have some lighting and some uh, air conditioning to finish off uh, this piece of work. And eventually we did it. Okay. And then over the years, I've collaborated with Nick on a number of projects. It's been very enlightening and uh, um, enjoyable for me. And I would say Nick's had a very uniformly positive influence both on my career and all aspects of my life. In fact, he's been almost like a brother to me over the years. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, Nick. So the topic I've chosen today should be uh, nice and simple, I hope, and uh, suitable for a wide audience. And essentially, it's a matrix reordering problem and in particular looking for what's called core periphery structure. And the new angle here really is to try and get something into the form where we can apply uh, some modern technology, a quantum annealer. Okay, so I'll go through those topics. This is joint with uh, Catherine Hyam, who is Nick's sister-in-law, and she's at Glasgow, um, and Francesco Tudisco, who is now in Italy. Um, and Catherine is the one who knows how to use a quantum computer. So she did the actual computing on this. Okay, so I'll just give a few pictures of matrices and things that we can do with them. So I'm going to show you on the left the matrix, symmetric, binary. So this is the spy plot in MATLAB. And on the right, if you do an appropriate reordering of the row and column or relabel the graph in network terms, then you get this structure. So that would be what we call a clustered uh, partitioning. So we, we've managed to find uh, a way of labeling the nodes in the graph so that clusters become obvious. And that's a very common problem in many areas of computer science and machine learning and more widely. Um, from our perspective in linear algebra, we, we tend to think of matrix reordering as a means to improve uh, computational performance or reduce errors and reduce fill in, for example. But in the network science community, this is where you might stop. You can see the structure uh, that's inherent in this network. And that's really the aim of the reordering. Of course, it does have lots of similarities uh, between the kind of matrix reordering algorithms that crop up um, in the sparse matrix world. So that's one sort of block structure. Um, that type of structure on the right there, that would sometimes be called a small world structure. So here, 
if you think of nodes in the graph, under the, the new ordering on the right, nodes tend to be connected to nodes which are close by in the ordering. So node, the, the links between nodes tend to be short range, or you don't stray very far from the diagonal uh, when you get these uh, non-zeros. And you have the occasional longer range um, edge or occasional node that's um, uh, edge that's far away from the diagonal. And you can have other versions. So a periodic version would be a wraparound structure where, where n is close to one. So these are essentially on a lattice, which consists of a periodic structure. Um, and you can have bipartite structure where there are two groups and group A tends to point to members of group B and group B tends to point to members of group A. So that's a, um, another type of structure you can look for. Um, the one I want to talk about today is core periphery structure. So this happens, loosely speaking, when you have a set of nodes, which on the right there would be the first block of nodes, which are well connected to everywhere in the network. So there's a group of um, individuals or nodes which are somehow able to create links across the whole network. And down in the bottom right hand corner, it's pretty sparse. So those nodes are not able to uh, create links with each other. That's called a periphery, but they can create links with the core. So interactions take place if at least one of the pair is in the core, but they don't take place if both nodes are in the periphery. Okay, that's the type of structure that we can look for. And of course, I have created all these pictures by starting on the right um, and then shuffling up to do the left. Uh, you won't always see this structure and which structure exists is an interesting question given real data. Um, but in network science, they like to find algorithms to try and identify whether these structures exist. And once you, once you know what the core is, then there might be some interpretation. Uh, in some sense, these are important uh, nodes in the network. Okay. And here's a visualization that I found on the web uh, of a graph or a network where the red nodes there would be the core and the yellow nodes would be the periphery. Okay. So here's a, a picture from a journal. Um, Everett, I think, is based at Manchester in the social network analysis um, uh, department or group. Um, this looks like a really old paper because it's actually typeset on a typewriter, but it's actually 1999. So I think that maybe the social sciences world didn't learn about LaTeX uh, for a long time. Um, so what they did here was take social science journals. So this is a symmetric matrix. Um, there are uh, 20 journals. Uh, given by these acronyms. Um, and they looked at which journals have papers that cite another journal uh, above some threshold. And they then by, they then symmetrized it to make it into a symmetric matrix. So a one means that those two journals tend to um, cite each other. And they, they rearranged this using some uh, genetic search algorithm uh, to try to get it into a core periphery form and they claim that there are some core journals which everybody takes notice of. And then there are some peripheral journals uh, which ignore each other, um, but they do uh, take account of the core. Okay, so it's one semi heuristic way of trying to identify which are the core journals in a field. Um, okay, and that paper is actually very interesting to read. It's full of good ideas, even though it's not really a maths paper. And they really synthesized this core periphery idea, which had been around in various forms across lots of different types of literature, they made the first um, definition of what core periphery might be. So loosely speaking, core nodes are strongly connected across the whole network and peripheral nodes are strongly connected only to the core. Um, there are lots of variations of this. So on the right hand side here, um, I'm showing more of a graded structure. So as you go down from in the and this picture on the right, as you go down from node one to node n, you're going from more core down to more periphery type nodes. So um, rather than having a, a, a zero one block structure, you're now saying that you tend to get non zeros uh, up as you go up towards the top left. Okay, but I'm, I'm today going to focus on this partitioning problem where you, you just assign to the core or to the periphery, the more binary version. Okay. Um, and there was an influential paper there cited at the bottom uh, from the network science community in a math journal where they took this idea and made it a bit more rigorous. They defined an optimization problem based on an objective function 
the eutogenetic search algorithm to solve the discrete optimization problem and gave examples of core periphery structure in various real networks. So I want to develop a new algorithm with a view to something that can be sent to a quantum annealer. So we're going to start um, in a way that many other authors started. So first of all, the notation A is a adjacency matrix and it's an undirected, unweighted graph. So A is a symmetric matrix either with zeros or ones in every position. There are N nodes, so it's N by N. And you might start by saying, uh, let's consider this optimization problem. Let's maximize um, this quantity here. So X is a vector. It takes uh, zero or one as its values. Um, Aij is one if i and j are connected. And why do we have a max here? Well, max xi and xj equals one if at least one of those two nodes has been assigned to the core, okay? Because x takes values of zero or one. So every time we have a correct assignment to the core um, and we have an edge in that position, then we add one to that summation. So we're counting how many times, based on this partition, how many times we've correctly identified edges uh, which involve at least one core node okay so you might try to maximize that over all possible partitions <clears throat> however that would just lead to the idea of assigning everything to the core because you're not being penalized for getting anything wrong okay so there are various ways to adjust this uh, you can add constraints the way that we're going to do it is to add a second term so here we're looking um in the data when there's no edge. So when one minus Aij um, is equal to one and one minus the max, that means that both of those have been assigned to the periphery in order to get a one out of that. So we're now counting how many times we correctly assigned edges uh, that exist, have at least one core node and that don't exist and have no core nodes. So that would be, I, 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 I would argue a more balanced objective function. But when we tried this, it still didn't seem to work. And that's really because real networks tend to be very sparse. So they have relatively few edges. So this second term dominates. And for typical sparse networks, this is, this is maximized by putting everything in the periphery. You're getting all the benefits of correctly identifying missing edges. And the relatively small number of existing edges don't have any effect on the optimization problem. OK. So we then came up with this normalized version so let's imagine there are N1 nodes, uh, so N1 edges in the data and N2 missing edges. And then we scale by one over N1 here and one over N2. So we're scaling by the frequency with which those two types of uh, data appear, or if you like, by the probability of seeing each one. Okay. And I'll do a little picture just to show that this we think is a much better approach, this objective function. So here I'm picking my own core periphery matrix. I'm randomly putting edges in independently in each position, but symmetrically. So there's some probability of the top left block um, having an edge and then uh, symmetrically uh, top right and bottom left and then the periphery. So here's a, what you would normally expect to see in a real network. This is a sparse version where the periphery is quite sparse. And um, here are the first 25 nodes we know they should be in the core based on the matrix that we've generated. So we then go along and look at what happens when you assign the first node to the core, then the first two nodes to the core, then the first three nodes and so on. And we're hoping that we get the best value for the objective function when we assign the first 25 nodes. And once you start assigning peripheral nodes, then the objective function should start to decrease again. Okay. And the red curve here is the normalized objective function. And that does peak at 25. But if you take the previous objective function of this second one, in the sparse case, it just keeps decreasing. So it wants to have um, it wants to have everything in the core. Okay, so it's not going to do a good job um, in this unbalanced setting. Um, and here are some um, other cases. In the extreme case of uh, a dense matrix, again, the normalized version still works but the unnormalized version now has the opposite effect, okay? And in these more balanced cases, then both of these versions do a reasonable job. 
Um, but we think this normalized objective function should be suitable for picking out this core periphery structure independently of the sparsity in the matrix. Okay. Uh, so let's just go back and have a look at that again. So this is our objective function, but remember that we have a binary, this is a discrete optimization problem. The X's have to be zero or one. Um, so there's a trick. We can just replace the maximum of Xi and Xj by that expression. And because X can, Xi and Xj can only be zero or one, it's equivalent to have X1, Xi squared plus Xj squared minus Xi, Xj, okay? And we're going to introduce this parameter rho, which is the sparsity on the number of edges divided by the number of non-edges. And then we can write that objective function in this quadratic form, this x transpose qx, where q is defined here. Um, A is the adjacency matrix, D is the diagonal matrix with the degree of each node or the row sum in each uh, diagonal component, and E is the adjacency matrix for the complete graph. So that has ones everywhere other than the diagonal where it has zeros. Okay, so it's just a rewriting of that objective function. And we would argue this is a useful thing to do if you had an algorithm which tried to find core periphery structure, you could look at this objective function. And if you wanted to compare it with another solution, then this would be one, one measure with which to compare your solutions. And what we like about this is compared to other um, objective functions in the literature, there are no parameters here. For example, you don't have to choose how big you think the core is. Uh, this, this works no matter what this, you know, no matter what core you've come up with, you can just plug it in and work out this number. Whereas many of the algorithms, a bit like k-means clustering, you have to say what k is before you start the algorithm, okay? Um, but also we can, we can try to optimize it. It's a discrete optimization problem. We can just try to optimize it. And Q here is going to be a full matrix because of the matrix E, but we can throw that away because it's multiplied by rho. And for most networks, they're sparse, so rho will be small. So an approximate objective function uh, can be formed just by using Q hat, where we've thrown away that final term. And Q hat now has the same sparsity as the adjacency matrix that we started with. And you can look at the difference in the objective functions with Q and Q hat, and that can be shown to be the sparsity factor rho times the number of elements in the core times the number of elements in the core minus one. So if you have a fairly small core and a sparse network, then these two objective functions will take very similar values. So there's a sparse version of the algorithm where you just apply it to Q hat, okay? So this is the exciting bit of the talk, which I know nothing about. This is quantum computing. Um, this is a little bit, a little bit of a sales pitch. Um, there's a lot of funding out there to develop um, quantum computing technology. And certainly in the UK, um, the current government, I think I can still say current government, um, is investing hugely. Um, they, they want to try and exploit quantum technology. Right now, there's not much out there that can be used in practice. So this, this is still in its infancy, um, but there's a lot of investment trying to make these things work. Um, my understanding is at the moment, the most useful things out there are very specialized things called quantum annealers. And that's what we're going to use uh, in this talk. Um, so they can solve a very restricted class of problems. Um, there's a particular machine in Canada that anybody can sign up for and you get a free minute on the machine. And I actually had a team of students doing this, a team of PhD students, and you can do quite a lot in a minute. And if you put things on GitHub, make them public, then you can get a minute every month. So if you have a three month project and three students, they can actually get quite a lot of quantum computing out of that deal, okay? <clears throat> and quantum annealers are designed to solve one particular class of problems called QBOs, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems. And they're precisely of the form I just described, um, well, minimize rather than maximize, but just multiplied by minus one. Um, a quadratic form with binary zero one uh, coefficients in the solution, okay? So in, in practice, you know, there are two to the power n possible solutions. You can't use calculus to get, get them, get the best one. Um, in practice, this will magically use quantum physics to zoom in and find you this optimal solution, okay, using 
things like quantum tunneling and entanglement and so on. Um, in practice, it's not quite so simple. Um, and what we do to use D-Wave is to set up the problem and ask it for a certain number of possible solutions or samples. So we, we asked it for a, a hundred, I think. So we, we got a hundred of its best guesses at the solution to the problem, okay? Um, and the actual quantum stuff that goes on uh, takes microseconds, but setting the problem up um, is a much bigger deal. And in particular, we found there's a limit to the size of the system you can solve. In the full case, around 100 by 100 for Q, and in the sparse case, up to around 6,000 for Q. So the, the, these are fairly limited in their capabilities. So we're really just trying to, to see what we can do with this machine. When um, you get the one minute, do you, do you lose the setup time, or is that free? The setup time is free, yeah. yeah. And it's in Python. It's very, very straightforward to do. You know, it's, it's really set up to be used. Um, OK, so here's one example from D-Wave. This is the, the journal uh, matrix I showed earlier. And we actually get the same best solution as the one in that paper. So whatever they did to find that solution matches the best X transpose QX. Um, here's the next best sample from D-Wave, which just added another node to the core and gave a slightly worse um, objective function, okay? Um, here's an example, um, a network where the nodes are words in a novel and nodes are connected if they appear in the same sentence. Um, so here's the original data in its original ordering, and here's what D-Wave found as a, a core periphery partition. Okay, so I'll just give a few results now. Um, over several networks here, I'm showing the objective function, the best objective function from various algorithms and from literature. Um, we couldn't use Q because it was too big for these examples. We could for these. Here we're using Q hat, and these are alternative algorithms. And I've highlighted the best answers, or the best two answers in each case. So the quantum annealing approach does seem to, to give us the best uh, out of the choice of algorithms here. It's a bit of a cheat because I'm measuring success using X transpose QX, and that's exactly what the quantum annealer is being asked to optimize. So it, maybe it's not too surprising that we get the best answers uh, from this approach, but at least we're seeing some results here, which we couldn't have otherwise found. The numbers of the score, the value of the X transpose QX, yep, yep. Okay, um, so that's a good uh, time to finish. What I tried to show here, was a couple of things. First of all, a new objective function. And what we like about it is that it's parameter free. So you don't have to plug in uh, anything like number of nodes in the core. It just automatically um, evaluates the, the, the um, some, in some sense in which your solution is, is a good core periphery partitioning. And we also made it into Kubo form, which means we can send it to the quantum annealer. Um, and by exploiting sparsity, throwing away that E term, uh, we can actually solve bigger size networks on this quantum annealer. So there's a, there's a, there's a potential there for uh, in, improving the size of problem that you can solve. Okay, so I'll finish there. Thanks for your attention.